all right hello welcome back parents i am so excited for our talk show for the 2021 through 2022 i know where those words are getting really tr tricky in our years a parent talk show get right with miss right and so today's topic is all about how to grow as a math family because i know that math has changed over the years and we are so grateful and so blessed to have our very own, very own special guest host, Tammy Zunker, which is our district math coordinator for early childhood through sixth grade. Yes. So if you even have some intermediate kiddos, please stay tuned. Um, she's going to give us all of the knowledge. And then we also have our amazing dad, parent, Matthew Moore, um, to give us some perspective from the parent side. And so I really like having a combination of us so we can just have a conversation, how we can collaborate as one, Team Bradley, Team Connor ISD, because in Connor ISD, we truly believe all means all. So let's get started, right? Because I know that this is um, a different conversation because we placed a lot of emphasis as I've spoken with Tammy on reading. Um, tell us a little bit about why is math so important and how and kind of why it's changed through these years. And so, of course, I have a great passion about, about, about math, but not only about math, um, as a subject, but also about kids being able to thrive and be successful in math. And so there's pretty much not a job out there in the world where you are not applying some type of mathematical skill. And so a lot of times when I even still go in and model in classrooms, I'll talk about that with kids and they like to challenge me and say, oh, but what about a bus driver? A bus driver doesn't have to you know, know how to do math. And I'll say, well, they do have to have to figure their distance they're driving and so that type of thing. I do think along the lines of that, though, that sometimes kids are more freely do reading outside the classroom mm -hmm. than they do math. And so we want to make sure that um, kids are feeling successful with math, not only in the classroom, but outside. And um, I encourage our teachers in Connor ISD to do that through a growth mindset where um, kids are know it's okay to have productive struggle in math, like everybody struggles when they're learning. And the goal is to have that growth mindset that, yes, I can, I can do anything. And so um, everybody can do math. And I think it's really, really important that uh, we instill that in our kiddos so that they know, even if it's hard, um, you know, we tell our teachers all the time, everybody needs productive struggle for your brain to grow. And so uh, if you're not having a little bit of struggle, then your brain is not, those dendrites aren't uh, growing. And so, yeah, I think that math is hugely important. Um, as we apply it outside the classroom. So Matthew, I know that you have your two kiddos. Tell us a little bit about um, how do they feel about math? Are they the same? What's your thoughts? Um, so I have a third grader, sorry, yeah, third grader <laughs> no, <laughs> yes. for a second, and a kindergartner. So I'm, I'm kind of seeing, I'm starting the beginning of what is the testing grade um, in, in our state for for math and kind of remembering what it was like when they were first uh, starting out. Um, you know, they they both enjoy it, and I think they they enjoy it in different ways. Um, and, and actually, I think you you were very you're very correct in how you said in the beginning that how I learned math um, in school is is not how um, my son or my daughter are learning math today. Um, but I, I try to keep in mind, you know, as I'm helping them or answering questions for them mm -hmm. is um, how my parents learned math wasn't how I learned math. Um, you know, when, you know, so grandparents maybe used an abacus, which is probably a word that our kid, my kids would never know. <laughs> um, so, you know, things change, strategies change. Um, but it, it, what my kids really enjoy is reading and they really enjoy um that aspect of education, and I think, I think Tammy, you're right. It just for whatever reason comes more naturally. Kids want to show it off, and so I think what's interesting is things like word problems, which were this mythical concept um, that we didn't learn about until we were in fifth or eighth grade, um, and we were just looking at you know numbers on uh, with a plus or minus sign <laughs> baked into everything they're doing. So it's a combination of something they already enjoy doing, uh, and they enjoy showing off their skills, and now they're you know, they're coming home and talking about how they read a problem as opposed to they did 
they did math. They read math or they, you know, understood a word problem as opposed to just numbers on a numbers on a grid, which I think is a little bit more, you know, practical in how I deal with it on a day to day basis in my normal life. I like how the the interconnection of um, and Tammy's going to go more into it on how it's changed over the years is that taking that same like not treating like reading and math just in total isolation like being able to connect the two because I think sometimes with parents we get a little stressed out because we're just so used to that rote memorization or just that abstract this and then when you get into the older grade levels you did see a word problem like whoa what is that um but being able to tell a story even from if something was in isolation or being able to write that um i think that we have moved into a more would you say tammy we moved into a more uh positive situation with math so <laughs> no, and i think I, what i always like to say it's not the math that's changed math has stayed the same the expectation of what we want our kids to know is what has changed and so it is still about the answer and I do think sometimes parents are like whoa but they have to do all this before they you know can tell the answer and so it's really about the processes that mm-hmm. take place their thinking processes that take place to get the answer and so that's how it's tested now so sometimes yes they do we are still just assessing the answer but oftentimes the answer choices are about the steps of the process and so I love how Matt talked about you know, problem solving. Back when we were in school, oftentimes you learned your computational skills. So those were those algorithms, the numbers and all of that. And then when the teacher felt like you were ready, they put that word problem in mm-hmm. front of you. The way we teach now is we constantly teach through a contextual situation, which is a word problem. And so kids are having to take those reading skills of context clues and predicting and using them in the math classroom, um, most every problem that's assessed in the testing grades is written through a word problem format. And so we need to give kids, we, we still need those computational skills, but they're embedded in that word problem. And so kids have to know the processes to break that word problem down and get to the math. And when we did it, we were in school, it was very isolated. Do the math, do the math, the teacher would track, do a problem, we would do 50 just like it. And now it's really different where we're having kids interact with one another through collaborative discussion and um, interact with us through the collaborative discussion to talk out loud about their thinking processes. And, you know, that is a huge skill. I mean, most jobs we step into now, you see uh, adults in rooms problem solving together. And so I I believe that it's a great change. but I do love how I get on Facebook and I say, what happened to the way I used to do math? <laughs> and so the math hasn't so much changed. The expectation of uh, how kids get to the answer and how they have to tell us how they solved is different. I-, I think that's the best way to describe it. Awesome. So moving on, parents, she's letting you know. It's good change. It's good change. I think it yeah, makes us feel change. a little bit uncomfortable just because we're so accustomed to what we used to do in the past but it goes back into like if we're trying to enhance and rebuild um restore renew a better generation then we need to set them up for that and so that requires a lot of that pro- uh, problem solving processing skills you know with reading writing all of that so we are really moving up so with that being said Um, I know sometimes teachers may use things, um, especially when you have um, the, the, you know, toddler, small ones from pre-K on up coming up, um, talking about number six. Like, what is that? Um, Especially because, you know, like we all have the standard base report card. And so sometimes let's just be honest, like when we're looking at that and it says my child doesn't know how to do this or my child is lacking in this reasoning. It's like, what is that? What's number six? So I think it's really funny. So if you, if you even on Google, if you Google number sense, you'll get a plethora of definitions for number sense. So what I like to say is when kids have a good sense of number and they can manipulate numbers in their head, oftentimes without a paper, without paper pencil. So kids who can see 54 and 36 and add that in their head without writing it on a piece of paper. And a lot of parents are like, what? We would write that on the piece of paper, regroup, carry the one. What are you talking about? 
But but our kids are being taught how to to put fifty four and thirty six in expanded form and maybe add the ten to fifty and thirty and get eighty and then add the ones, the four and the six and get eleven and then put it together that way and never need a piece of paper to do it. And um, oftentimes we get third graders that can do that in their head. But really, if you stop and think about when I go to Walmart I, and I'm estimating how much money I'm going to spend, I don't whip out a piece of paper out of my purse and start doing the algorithm. You know, I look at prices and I manipulate numbers in, the, in my head to see how I'm going to spend my money and stay within that $200 or whatever I'm going to spend. And so giving the, I think that's what number sense is. And, and I do believe that, um, our kiddos are, every child is born with an innate ability, an innate amount of number sense. But if it's not something that's practiced, it's kind of like learning to ride the bike. If you don't practice it all the time, then you months go by and you go to get on it, you're a little apprehensive. And so it's our teacher's job to make sure we're building on that number sense in the classroom um, where kids are learning things in the lower grades like how many more to make 10. Mm. And understanding the anchors of 5 and 10 and using that to do so much math. And so, yeah, number sense is the ability to be able to m make sense of numbers without that paper pencil and manipulate them in your head. And kids who are solid in that, you will hear it in their voice and in their body language when they're talking because they feel confident in the math. So, Matt, have you tried, you know, using any of those tactics at home or, you know, seeing some of your kids kind of use it off the bat? Yeah, and you, Tammy, I think what's what's interesting is one of the things you sometimes hear parents um, say and is, you know, teach practical skills, teach practical skills, and then this is a, to your point, this is a completely practical skill. I, I've seen some of my kids' work come home and... You know, the question will be about how much was, you know, was this total? And I'm looking at it going, I do this all the time. You know, there are times someone asks me a question in my job where it's, I give them, you know, I, I give a roundabout answer because I don't know what the exact answer is, but that rounded answer or about answer moves the conversation forward. So it's a very practical skill. And so I see my kids. Um, doing it all the time, where I'll say, you know, or we'll ask them, oh, go get, how much do we have in the refrigerator, or how much, uh, you know, how many apples, or how many, you know, how much fruit do we have, and, you know, they'll just kind of generally look at it and say, oh, it's about this much, uh, you know, and, and that's a practical skill, that's a practical skill um, that that I use, that, you know, I'm glad to see my kids are learning. I agree, and, you know, math, I always say, Math is like building a house, and the foundation starts in our early grades of pre-kinder and kinder. But what happens there, then first grade builds on that, and second grade, and third grade. And so one of the things I do love about our teaks, Ashley, is that they're very ver they have great vertical intent like that. And so one of the things that's caused me great angst with COVID <laughs> is thanks to COVID, now I call it a Jenga tower, and you can only pull out so many Jenga blocks before the tower gets really weak, but math builds on math. And so um, if every teacher's in their lane and their grade doing their job, then our kids will come when, when the math gets harder and you hit fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, if they have math tools in their pocket from the early grade and they're building that number sense when the math gets harder, they're able to stick with the math and be successful. So speaking of, I'm done here, I'm gonna roll down a couple of notes. So speaking of, I heard you say teaks, right? And mm -hmm. I and I know sometimes, like us as educators, we get in our lingo and our language, and so I parents are like, to ask, what, 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 "What is that word? You use an acronym there that, uh, that I'm not sure I've ever heard before." So that is an acronym from the state of Texas for Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, and so they're not just in math; they're in um, actually all of our content areas. And so that is where our state standards fall within our Texas essential knowledge and skills. And so every grade level has a set of TEKS for math that is specific to that grade level. And for math, they're very vertical, they have great vertical intent. So a lot of what kinder does, first grade also does some of that, but takes it to a higher level. And then second grade, so forth and so on. Yeah. So is there, there 
is there a place that sometimes like where parents can go look for it? Like if they were like, I need to know, like, you know, right. would you advise a parent to maybe just kind of glance at it so they, they can maybe have like sure. a starting place? I think so. a couple of places. So you can always go to TEA's website. You should prepare for a moment if you go there because it's a huge site and you can t- type in the search box. Uh, math peaks t-e-k-s and get the very very lengthy version of mm-hmm. these but on our connor isd web page there is a place to go to get some general knowledge of the teaks in each grade so i'm gonna can i share my screen yes. with you, ashley yes yes go okay. for it so a lot of times i've talked parents through this on the phone but when you this is our web page so when you uh, log in right here they're kind of hidden so you go to more right here at the top where there are three little dots and then you would come down to departments. And so the curriculum is found under teaching and learning. So you gotta go all the way down to the T's here. And when you get to teaching and learning, you're gonna see over here, you see math, science, social studies, but I'm gonna take you right here. If you click on teaching and learning, scroll down just a little bit, you're gonna see pre-K-8 curriculum guides. Now, this is not like the entire curriculum guide that our teacher get, teachers get. This is a PDF document. But when you go, so this is pre-K. So it shows you in every area in pre-K what they should know. So let's just scroll down to, here's first grade. So here shows general um, bulleted statements about what they're going to learn in language arts. Here is general bulleted statements about math. So you'll see applying basic, applying place value to the numbers up to 120. And so solving addition and subtraction up to 120. Um, so this is a place for a parent to go, especially like Matt, who yeah. has a five-year-old, so he can look at kindergarten, right? And then he could scroll down and look at uh, third grade, which is coming right here, and he could see, okay, this is generally um, what my child is a lot, is going to learn in third grade. I like to direct parents there. Now, you can always go to TEA's website and get all the numbering for every T. There's a lot of them. But this gives you more of that overarching general view. And what's really cool is if a parent was to look at kinder and then first, they would see some commonalities between kinder and first and first and second. Um, So, yeah, that's what I would recommend for parents to go and look at. And then if they want to go deeper, then maybe go. The TEA, but um, well, I think that's why I think lets a parent know what they're going to need right. to know for next year. Yes, and I and I feel like that's important because it's not even though this is a math driven conversation, but they can look right. at reading and they can they look see at, all content area there, mm-hmm, and they can look yeah, at and, each grade level. And, and I I think you, it, just when we were scrolling through that and glancing at, I feel like those are things you hear during the the teacher or you know the open houses where you go at a very 5,000 foot level, kind of go over, these are the things we're going to learn this year. What I think is, it's like they're actually going at a, they're actually at a 50,000 foot level. That's the 5,000 foot level, what you just showed, which is the summary of what's, I'm assuming a much more technical document uh, uh, that someone who's It's a little overwhelming on TEA's website, but you can't go there. It's public knowledge, so yeah. Well, let's move into, and I'm glad you said that piece too, Matthew, because I think at the beginning of the year when we, you know, um, and he'll be back with us, when we um, first start and we come in with orientation and our minds are just on overload because we're trying to receive all of the knowledge that the teachers are saying, but it's an ongoing process. So just want to let you know, parents, you know, you may look at it because some of you may have two or three or four kids and you're like, ugh whoa um but rest assured just you know quickly glancing maybe at certain areas you see that your child is bringing on homework or teachers giving feedback this is where we are when they're giving out their um, monthly newsletters Um, i know that at bradley uh, we have all of our teachers that give uh, what they're doing in math what they're giving in social studies and to look at that to see like you know this is what we're doing and this is where you know my kid needs to be and then that way you can have a really good solid conversation with the teacher because i i did have a couple of parents you know that come to me as a counselor i don't even know where to start like i don't like i know my child needs help but like i don't even know what to ask for so i think looking at those can be a really great conversation starter to say hey um you know 
I noticed my child not being able to count to 20, you know, or, you know, what are some of the things that I can do? Because I see I can see you're up to 20, but my child gets stuck at, you know, one to 10 or what have you. So um, with going with struggles, this is another thing. So if you're if a child is a struggling reader, Tammy, how can our parents help him or her with word problem solving? Because I know that that's a major thing, especially when, you know, some of our kids are diagnosed, you know, with dyslexia or they may not be the best reader. Sure. Um, Absolutely. may have a third grader, right? Um, you know, Matt's, you know, son is in third grade, but what if your child is reading like on a first grade, you know, or second grade level, but, you know, it's third grade star right. with third grade Absolutely. reading. Absolutely. So what do we so do? I would say a couple of things. So one thing I would say first is, and this is gonna, this may sound a little out there, but one of the things we encourage our teachers to do is initially to remove the numbers from the word problem. So at home, that might mean putting sticky notes over the word, over the numbers, and just talk about the context of the problem. What's happening in the problem? Tell me what you know. And sometimes kids will tell you this is a story about baseball. Okay, well, what are they talking about? They're talking about how many bats they have and how many balls they have, okay. Well, and then gradually remove whatever you're covering the numbers with and bring the numbers back. So for a lot of our kiddos, third grade's a lot. So I like to say third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, they're the rough years, right? And that's a lot for a child. And they see the numbers and yeah. immediate mm -hmm. angst goes up. I I'm supposed to do math, but here's the thing. You can't solve the word problem if you don't understand the context of the problem. Are they asking me to join the balls and the bats together? Do they want to know the difference between? And so what we've noticed, we call them numberless word problems. What we've noticed is when teachers take the numbers out for a minute and just have a good reading conversation about the word problem and get past all that. What is? What do we know? What do we not know? Where is it? And then we put the numbers back in. They, they approach the problem in a different way. So that's one thing. I think the other thing you can do sometimes is reduce the size of number. So if you're a third grade student and wow. there's three digit numbers there, a lot of kids are like, I got nothing, I, I can't even. But if you take out those numbers and replace them with even single digit numbers or double digit numbers, um, and then work back to those larger numbers, that helps. And then lastly, I think, is making sure they either have paper pencil where they can draw a picture, I mean, if it's big numbers or actual manipulatives, which at home can be lima beans, pennies, <laughs> fruit loops, something you already have in your kitchen most most of the time, um, Legos, whatever it might be, and they're using that to build what the problem looks like. So those things are great when the numbers are small. When the numbers get bigger, maybe drawing pictures to show um, their thinking. Because sometimes we just wish we could see what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. I used to always say as a classroom teacher, I wish I could put a machine over their little head and x-ray to see what they're thinking. But we need kids to talk out loud about what they're thinking and represent it either with hands-on manipulatives, some of the examples I gave, or drawing a picture. But I really would encourage parents to take the numbers out and just talk about the problem. What is happening? What is the action in the problem? Is there an action in the problem? and have those great discussions and then put the numbers back in. Even sometimes our highest kids, because they can do math mm -hmm. so quick, I call them numbers kiddos. They can always get the right answer, but then when we stop and ask them, how did you get the answer? Justify your thinking. They look at us like, why are you asking me that? Don't you know the answer is 72? <laughs> but sometimes the test asks them to justify their thinking. So I just think it's something that's great for, for all kids to do. So it sounds like I really like it's more of a conversation. And I think that's a powerful mm -hmm. piece because I think we get hooked up on even if we did have some type of homework. And I know some do, some um, don't give homework. But even when you're practicing at home, don't get so caught up into, well, my kid has to do these five word problems. You know, maybe just stick with one to really get them to start thinking and covering up those numbers. Do you even understand what's happening, which is a reading like we said with struggling readers, the who, what, when, um, to get them to understand that. And then I love, oh my gosh, Tammy, I totally forgot about that. And I used to be a teacher. You um, that. I, <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh my goodness. But I was like, yes. Um, that's a 
really great feedback to give some of, our, uh, some of my parents too. But covering the numbers or even making them smaller, like you said, yeah. there's no harm in it makes that. Makes it more approachable. Mm -hmm. It takes the anxiety away, you know. Um, I think too, even for our younger grades, when they're not doing word problems yet, um, it, when you're in, the, there's no better place to talk about math than in the kitchen. And so, even if it is where you're telling them, tell me how many square containers are in the Tupperware cabinet. How many round containers? What's the difference between the two? Um, how many plates, dinner plates versus, you know, uh, saucer plates? Or I think there's just so many opportunities in the kitchen, just with the stuff in the kitchen, or even when you're cooking and you're saying things like, I need to double the recipe. What does that mean? Um, what does double mean? Well, if I have two cups, that means doubling it's going to be four cups. I think sometimes. We live our life so fast now, we forget those opportunities to bring the kids into the kitchen um, and put some things out in front of them. And even if the littles that aren't ready to help cook yet, get the lima beans out and tell them, make me four stacks of five and count how many you have or count out 20. And the mom's in there just cooking or dad is cooking away and the kids are one-to-one -one counting on the bar next to them. Um, we do that so well with reading, I think, where we read a book before we go to bed mm. and we do all those great things, but we don't always get to that with math. I also think it's fun to do that mental type of math in the car when you're driving. I think I have six pieces of candy and I'm going to give Miss Wright three pieces of candy. How many pieces of candy am I going to have left? Or we're just doing simple things like that. Um, in the car or counting how many beetle bugs we see when we're driving on the freeway. That's math. And talking to kids outside of school about what math is um, in our homes and at our jobs. I like how you make it so comfortable because I think that that's another piece with parents too. It's just like it doesn't have to be so formal and so like just structured and I got to say it this way because this is the way the teacher gave it to me. Um, most important, um, and I know you two would agree with me, is just still connecting and building that relationship with your child. So now you're just having a discussion. You're hanging out in the kitchen. I'm still cooking and grooving, but um, I'm talking to you about math, and it's a safe, like, non, you know, you know, the teacher said that you have to do this this way, or it's not confrontational. So I, I really like that. Um, let's get into, as we start to close, um, what about, what are some like good programs or websites or books or, and Matthew, you can chime in too, um, if you have any questions that parents can use. Cause I know sometimes like, do I need to go to Barnes and Nobles or do I need to go on Amazon and just go buy these kind of books? You know, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things out there you can spend money on, but one of the things that I'm loving right now is Dreambox. And so all of our kids that attend Bradley have access to DreamBox at school and DreamBox at home. And I am not a huge fan of a lot of computer programs, but I'm a huge fan of DreamBox. Because if kids are working and, and we don't want mom and dad to help, we want the question mark in DreamBox to help. But the writers of DreamBox were math specialists like me who built the program based on student misconceptions. So, for example, if a child is struggling with a representation maybe of strip diagrams for problem solving, Dreambox is going to continue to give them work on strip diagrams until they master that representation. And so it's very, I've never seen a program that's quite as individualized as Dreambox. Now, if a parent helps too much at home, then the pathway becomes the parent's pathway and not the student's pathway, and then sometimes the child gets uncomfortable. So the question mark is essential in DreamWorks. Um, the first time you click the question mark, she will probably repeat the same thing, but most teachers will probably do that as well. But it, a child can click the question mark multiple times, and even if that means she takes them to the answer, that's okay. She's teaching them how to get the answer, and then another problem will come up. The one other thing I was going to share with our parents that they may or may not be aware of is there is a, a web page. Um, so if you type in didact.com, it looks like this. But if you scroll down to the bottom right here, you can get free virtual manipulatives. So if you click on it, let's take just a second. So you're going to see that these are Unifix Whoa. cubes, two color counters. Wow. So, so a lot of our kids will love this because they're virtual. But if I click 
on two color counters. These are just counters. So think about beans or whatever. And um, you're in the kitchen cooking and they have this on the computer and you say, I had five tacos. And the little, your child says, oh, five. My tacos are going to be yellow. So they can pull five over here, right? And three enchiladas and my enchiladas are going to be red. And then the mom or dad might say, so how many Mexican food items did you have? And the child would say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they would count. And so I love that Didax, Didax did this for us um, a year and a half ago, I guess, and they've left it free. And so there's lots of options of manipulatives there. Um, and sometimes our kids are more attracted, attracted to the virtual side of things because they love playing the computer games and it allows them to click and drag. Um, and then mom's just, mom or dad is just in the kitchen cooking or doing whatever, and the kids are uh, working over there and taking that mental and making it a more, not quite hands-on because it's virtual, but a virtual hands-on. Those would be two things that I would say that are two simple things that kids have access to. Um, our pre-kindergartners don't have access to Dreambox, but Kinder through fourth grade at Bradley does have access to Dreambox, and everybody can access these Didax manipulatives. So, so, Tammy, I have a, I have a question. Sure. Um, and, and I, and, and I, it's a balance question. Of where do you balance the the technology aspect of teaching math versus the you know pencil and paper aspect of teaching math? And, and I think back to my you know being in school. One of the things you know my teachers always tell me is you have to know how to do this because you'll never be able to carry a calculator around with you wherever you go. Which today, you know, which today seems like one of the most absurd things to have ever been said before in, in the history right. of everything because they now spell it, check, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah spell check. Um, you want our spell check? But I mean, it, it exists, and sure. you know, there's there's no way around it. So, you know, where's the balance between pencil and paper and the technology? Where should we, we be? Yeah. So here's what I would say. I think every child, no matter how much they struggle or how much they don't struggle, should start with manipulatives. It's about how hands-on. It's about how long they need them to me. So here's what I feel. When you can see as a parent, they don't need to, and I'm just going to think kindergarten, they don't need to have those manipulatives to one-to-one -one count anymore. They can count a picture of objects without getting lost because a lot of five-year-olds, you can't move the picture, right? So they get lost with it. But if they can, then I think they're ready for pictures. If they can't, they still need manipulatives. And so God. it is a balance. A lot of times kids can get the answer and they don't need the manipulatives. I think the thing we have to remember is the state of Texas often tests us with pictures of manipulatives. So if the kids, some of our brighter kids, have never worked with manipulatives because they didn't need them. So what they're doing when they put a picture of manipulatives is they're, test they're testing the process. So how would you use these manipulatives to solve this problem? And so I think it's I think all kids need hands-on. How long they need it, it is based on most kids will just stop using them when they don't need them anymore. And so um, I definitely K2 needs manipulatives much, much more than when you hit third, fourth. But one of the things I see happening is sometimes in third grade, we – take them away too quick and developmentally, some of our third graders aren't there yet. And I think with COVID, we have a lot of that, depending on where kids sat last year. Um, and then from March to May, when we got sent home and never came back. And so um, I guess that's not the most concrete answer, Matt, but I think it's really based on the individual needs of the child. A lot of kids who can't do the abstract, the minute you get manipulatives out, manipulatives out it kind of all comes together for them. And so, yeah, and I didn't even show, but there's even base 10 blocks in here that shows how to break them apart. So like when you need to- Oh, show us that, really quick, show us really quick. Yeah, let me show you real okay. quick. Um, because that is one of the, the biggies. So when you click on the base 10 blocks and you take a 10, and you drag it over here to the what? Let me see if I can do it correctly. So this is 100. But if I want to, uh, I think I can take it. And oh, that's how I erase it. There is a way where you can. 
Or put the tens in the ones, maybe? Well, I thought, I thought it was a hammer. Um, and you can break it apart, but maybe you can't on this one. Maybe hmm, you can change the grid unless it's underneath my screen and I can't see it. Anyway, there is a way then, maybe if I bring it over here, it'll, no, it must be the other program I'm thinking about. But what we want be able, kids to be able to see that this 10 is made up of, Ten of these ones, and so I guess you'd have to do it this way, and then erase the ten. But you I see what I'm saying. Yeah, I think yeah. that's still powerful. Can, once you get ten here, yeah. then you could erase the ten. I think that'll be still good though for parents to see, like even if you did use this, like to put it right next yes. to the ten, um, and not saying parents don't know, but like when you're. I love how we're talking about the language, like base 10 blocks. Well, so. one of the most <clears throat> missed things with our kindergartners mm -hmm. and first graders is unitizing. And that is when kids see a set of 10 on a 10 frame, and they don't count them anymore. So if they see um, a 10 frame is a grid, right, that has five on the top and five on the bottom. Well, when kids truly unitize that and they see it as a group of 10, if they see 10 there and three more, they don't go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They go 10, 11, 12, 13. That's well, a lot of times we have kids who leave kindergarten not unitizing, and then when we start talking about place value, they get a little lost because they still have to count 1 to 10 to trust themselves that that's a group of 10. And so um, I've, I've talked to our, our kinder and first grade teachers, when well, you think they can unitize? And they're like, Sure, and then they'll say you check, and then you know not necessarily they can all the time, and that is a huge beginning of place value, and you know a lot of kids learned that virtually, mm -hmm. which is not the same as building on that ten frame in front of their teacher and her pausing and saying how many do you have? So, all right, yeah. so parents use those manipulatives. I did see some ten frames yeah. and have them put <laughs> them physically on there. I think that would be very helpful. All right. And dry erase markers oh. <laughs> on on a desk or tables and wipe off are the best way to do things too. Yes. And you're probably like, I don't have those. Um, I know that the Dollar Tree always has um, yep. really, really dry cheap. Dry erase markers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the really, really cheap boards. So, you know, yeah. but I love how you said using, you know, food items or whatever it is that you're needing. I know everyone has a boop cell phone. So let's do it. <laughs> Or an I iPad. Agree. I agree. <laughs> All right. So we are going to end with some questions. So we did get a couple of questions in. I think we hit the first one just to re-emphasize. Um, one parent asks, what type of programs are best for learning math? And I know that you said Dreambox. But um, I guess if you can't access Dreambox for whatever reason, um, and maybe you're not in Well, our parents also do have access to our textbook. So Savas is our textbook, and they can always get with their child's teacher okay. um, about that. And that wouldn't cost anything either. And so there are other free programs out there. Prodigy is a, a computer program that's free. I, I would say Dreambox over Prodigy any day. But um, those are a couple of other ones, Ashley. Okay. And um, one last thing. Is there a website also that you were referring to um, that our district has, the teaching and learning or something where um, that's where I went to show okay. um, what each grade level okay. teach is, and then if you go to math there, you can get to the math website. Um, there's a little bit more of information there, and there's also my contact information there. Awesome. So email Tammy if you have questions. You can email me. Mm -hmm. um, two, we, uh, we've already talked about in the math. Math you hit on it. Everything is so digital. Um, and not on paper, so how can I teach it? And we're aware of that, um, especially because we have virtual, so we touched on that. Um, I think it is um, very helpful, Tammy, if I'm not mistaken, how we talked about the use of those um, digital manipulatives. Because I know even, too, with the analog clock, you know, everything is the digital clock. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's like, I say hands-on as much as you can. Even though our kids have been exposed to a lot of digital, and it has its great perks, but some kids still just need that hands-on. Uh, it's just it's just essential in math. It, it caused me great anxiety when we went home in March and did not come back, especially our littles, because our young kids are still, 
I like to say K2 is building math to put in their tool belt, and they weren't quite there yet um, to then be able to turn it around in our third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. So, yeah, hands-on as much as possible. Okay, and our last one um, with counting money. So teachers use hairs. What is that? Do I use so, hairs too? <laughs> hairs represent increments of five. So, and a dot represents one. So a penny gets a dot, a nickel gets one hair, a dime gets two hairs, five, ten, right? And a quarter gets five hairs, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, oh. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, five hairs. <laughs> now, I get asked all the time, do I hate hairs on coins? Well, what is really more frustrating to me is nobody has money anymore. And so, kids, you know, when I was growing up, my dad kept his money on the bar and a tray, and I, my mom would make me sit there while she was kicking, and I would have to count the money. It is also very frustrating to me that I go to Sonic, and the teenagers cannot make my change. But that's another conversation. <laughs> I may bust out a math lesson at Sonic on occasion. However, <laughs> even though we live in a credit card, debit card world, I do think my counting money is an essential skill. What I'll say about hairs, Ashley, is most kids, once they master counting money, they don't draw hairs anymore because they don't want to. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they're awful. I don't think they're... The problem is kids, if they don't know their coins and the value, switching from a set of coins to another set of coins when counting money is challenging so like if they have two quarters two nickels four pennies what you watch kids do is go 25 50 and then they struggle to switch that the denomination of coin to the next one so i used to always teach my kids count one set of coins that are common like quarters or maybe even dimes 10 20 30 40 before you start counting the nickels so that your brain knows I'm switching now from counting by tens to counting by fives. It's hard. I mean, it is hard for our kids. And so a lot of kids draw hairs to represent those fives. Eh. But then the question becomes, are they just counting by fives and realizing they've gone from dimes to, to nickels? Uh, but for the most part, they can get the right answer with hairs. And once they count money enough, they just stop using them because they don't need them anymore. So it's more of a practice thing, just getting them yes, accustomed to Yes, more of a practice thing. Awesome. But I would love if parents would put change out for kids and have kids count change. And I know most of our parents would love that, too, because they probably don't love Because, you know, now if the register doesn't tell people what change to give back, they're lost. You know, and it wasn't that way when we were growing up because <laughs> we had to know how to make, well, my mom made me learn to make change. So, And, of course, my kids that are 21 and 27, they, have to, they know how to make change, but that's because their mother made them learn. So, anyway, yeah. Awesome. Well, I am sure. so excited that we, we've shared a lot. Matthew, did you have any other questions or comments? No, I, I thought this was very enjoyable. I think there is, um, I think for parents, whenever you see your kids learning something new, um, the natural instinct is, well, I didn't, the way I learned it wasn't wrong. And, and you start thinking that, you know, yeah. You, that you didn't, that your way wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's, you know, we, everything changes over time. You know, they learn, you know, just like, you know, we, I use new technology at work that I didn't use 10, 15 years ago. Things change and improve as supposed to. So, you know, I think this helped take a lot of fear in my mind of it's different. It's a different way to learn it, but the numbers still equal the exact same thing as I learned. Exactly. You're right, Matt. That is so true. And I think the last thing I would say, Ashley, is make math fun. You yes. know, and not so intimidating for our kids because it can be fun. And when kids feel confident, then it is fun and they're not afraid of math. And so, you know, oftentimes I hear parents say, well, I wasn't good at math. And so be careful about that, you know, and tell your kids you can do it and build them up and give them credit for effort, which is that growth mindset. Effort makes a difference. If you're trying hard to get better, um, rather than um, <clears throat> making them feel like they always have to be right. But I think that that math is, if it was so easy all the time, their brains wouldn't be growing. And so um, make it fun, make it enjoyable, make it a part of your everyday life. You know, when you're sitting there figuring out the tip, ask them, so, oh, I got to add this four and a seven. 
how would you do that? Why would I put three with that seven to make 10 and add one more mom? But we don't, you know, we don't think about those opportunities to do math with our kids outside the classroom like we do reading. And so I think that's what I would suggest. Make it fun. Well, Tammy has boosted my confidence level because I was good at math. <laughs> Well, yeah, was she was a great math teacher. <laughs> I know I spent time in her classroom. As yes, a teacher. and I was learning. So thank you, um, Matthew, for addressing that elephant because it is different. And then we don't want any of our parents to feel like so intimidated, like I, you know, I'm dumb or I can't get this. I can't even teach my child. Right. You know, use the opportunity to grow with your child and learn a new way. Like, oh, you taught me that. That's you right. Know, we're working together. And mm-hmm. Reach out to the teachers and let them help you because. Um, they will. They will. Yes. Well, parents, thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions, um, I will drop um, Tammy's information below in the comments. And so feel free to visit those um, resources and websites. Thank you, Matthew, for joining us. Nice on to meet you, Matt. <laughs> school day. And we <laughs> will look forward um, to our next topic next month. Stay tuned. It's one that you don't want to miss. All right. Bye.